Welcome to Power and Piety, Sp uh, yeah. Spanish colonial art. This is an exhibition that was organized, co-organized by the Museum of Biblical Art in New York and Art Services International. And it was curated by Jorge Rivas Perez. Um, and it's one of three exhibitions that we're presenting this fall on the second floor that are all related. And they're related in terms of geography. You may have seen the map of what was known as the Spanish Main downstairs at the bottom of the stairs. Um, that map comes from the Power and Piety exhibition, but the three shows that we have, um, the places that were significant for those shows are all represented in the area of that map. The other thing that links the three shows, um, Angel Suarez, Rosado, Talisman, and Mola Social, Social Fabric, and this show, are issues of colonization and resistance, um, as well as the hybridity in the artwork that was produced as a result of those historical events. So what we're looking at today in Power and Piety is um, religious art, more specifically Christian art, um, and much of it, and yes. You said hybridity. Yes. Um, and I'm going to talk more about that, okay. but essentially cross-cultural exchange okay. that influenced the way that the artworks ended up looking and that um, produced really artworks that were unique in that these these combinations um, were the result of a kind of globalization that was happening for the first time. So at this time, you had um, the Spanish and other European um, colonists going to the Americas, the New World, um, but they were also subsequently going to Asia and Africa. And so for the first time, you have this linking of five continents. So that's really what I'm talking about when I say hybridity. Um, yes? I sent them. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, so... Um, this is an exhibition of Spanish colonial art. Much of the work here was made for the Catholic Church um, and also for people's homes. And we have in this exhibition a wide range of materials. We have painting, sculpture, decorative arts, silver, um, and furniture. And this is a time period of the late 1600s to the 1820s. Um, by the 1820s, many of these regions became independent of Spain and Portugal. Um, so this exhibition of Spanish colonial art is unique in that most exhibitions of Spanish colonial art that you'll see deal with um, Peru and Mexico. Those were vice regal centers of the Spanish Empire and Portuguese Empire. Um, whereas this show deals with the Caribbean and the mainland areas surrounding the Caribbean, and most especially Venezuela. All of this work is from a single private collection. It's the Patricia Phelps de Cisneros collection, which is part of the Cisneros Foundation. And their goal is to foster global awareness of Latin America's contributions to culture. Many of the works in this show have been promised to museums, which is really wonderful. Some are going to um, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, some to the Denver Art Museum, where the curator um, who did this show is now the curator of Spanish colonial art. Um, and a large number of, the, of them are going to um, the Blanton Museum in Austin, Texas. Um, so, not being um, a specialist in Spanish colonial art, I can attest to the fact that um, there is a lot to absorb in this show. Um, so I wanted to ask that you please um, focus on the um, tour notes and the research materials that I gave you. I know it's already a lot. Um, I'm sure pretty shared with you the digital version of the essays from the catalog. We also have that catalog um, of the exhibition available in the library if you'd like to use it there. And it's also, of course, available for sale in the museum shop. Um, and I did try to, in the tour notes, give you um, more information than you need to actually say. 
um, just to give you more background and so that you'll feel more comfortable in terms of the concepts that we're trying to communicate. So the work in this exhibition reflects the position of the Spanish colonial Caribbean as a center for transatlantic trade and cultural exchange. That's really one of the key points uh, of this exhibition. Um, and one of the things that isn't so much covered in the exhibition itself, this exhibition is really in a sense, a celebration of the cultural flowering that happened as a result of this cultural in exchange. Um, but I wanted to include, I included an extensive quote from Govan Bailey, a scholar um, on Latin, colonial Latin America, um, because I think it's important to think about the background and the effects, um, both positive and negative, when we talk about colonization. And I just want to read the very first sentence of that quote because I think it really gets to everything succinctly. He says, few episodes in the history of the world evoke at once the awe, wonder, and sadness of Europe's encounter with America. So Europeans were coming to these places that already had their own culture and history. And in some cases, that was a devastating encounter. So just keep that in mind as being part of the background of what we're looking at here. So from the 17th, late 17th century until the 1820s, a period of this exhibition, um, colonists in the Americas were becoming extremely wealthy um, from cattle ranching and also from tropical crops like indigo, sugar cane, cocoa, and tobacco. So this group of wealthy people created a market for the artworks that you're going to see in this show. So many painters, gilders, sculptors, um, furniture makers were commissioned by these wealthy um, colonists. And the works that they were making had to be of a quality to compete with works that could be imported from Europe. Um, and there was a very, um, there was a strong influence of European art and aesthetics. And one of the things I know you're very familiar with our Crest Collection, um, and one of the things that I was thinking about in terms of bringing this show here was, um, you know, our Crest Collection has European 14th to 16th century Christian art. Um, and this exhibition essentially is what came next. So. In terms of time period, there's a European influence. You'll see iconography that you recognize. Um, but then there are um, materials and techniques that the artists use that they took from their own history. So um, this exhibition has three thematic sections. And the one that we're in now is religious art at home. Um, this exhibition, or this section, is art that would have been created for more public spaces of the home. So in a wealthy home, they might have had um, kind of a reception room. And pieces such as this stunning tabernacle would have impressed upon their visitors not only um, the wealth and status of these people, but also their piety and the, their um, dedication to um, Christianity. Um, so a work such as this would have been the focal point of a room. And you can see that a lot of elaborate work has gone into it. Um, this is how the piece looks open. Um, but it does have these doors that fold around, so you can close it up. Um, this is, in the center here, a sculpture, polychrome sculpture of the Immaculate Conception, which in Christianity referred to the purity of the Virgin Mary, uh, mother of, of Jesus. Um, the technique here is fascinating to look at. Um, so this, uh, it's called estofado, and it is um, a technique that required many layers of work. Um, and to simplify it, they did a layer of the gilding first, um, and then they would paint over the gilding, and then scratch away the gilding to create these patterns that are on her cloak. 
and then even carve into that afterwards, which you can see on the very edge of her cloak. Um, she's standing on a dragon. The dragon represents Satan. So she's being, she's symbolizing um, the overcoming of evil. Um, this very first work that we're looking at um, gets to this whole idea of cross-cultural exchange in a really interesting way. Um, also, I should have said, um, after, we, after I go through the gallery, um, we're going to be doing a workshop where we'll talk more about um, questions and kind of uh, how we might engage visitors with those questions. But for now, I'm going to mostly quickly go through just the information and take any questions that you guys have. Yes? So can you explain how it pronged? I know we have some other things, and is it just that it means it's painted, or is that the gilding underneath, or what is? Polychrome just means it's painted with multiple colors. Okay. Fancy word for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, in this piece, um, the background, the floral design with the red background, is thought to have possibly been influenced by Asian textiles. And that's fascinating because um, you might think, well, where were they seeing these Asian textiles? Um, at this time, beginning in the 1560s, um, Spain colonized the Philippines. And so they began a trade. There was a ship, and it was called the Manila Galleon, and it would travel once or twice a year, the trip from Acapulco in Mexico to Manila in the Philippines. And what that meant was um, that now Europeans, American, and Americans were connected to Asia. So there was trade um, with China. So much of the silver that was one of the great commodities of the Spanish Empire in the Americas um, was traded through this Manila galleon trade to Asia, as much as a third of the silver mined. Um, and then they would bring back um, exotic spices, um, things like uh, ivory, which you'll see in these two sculptures, um, silk. So um, Asian textiles would have been something that they did have access to in the Spanish colonies because of this Manila galleon trade. Um, and that Manila galleon trade um, actually, that name? I'm sorry. it's Manila, like the, the town, um, and galleon, like the ship. Um, and this continued for about 250 years. Um, the other thing that is interesting to introduce to your visitors, I think, is imagine all of these works without any artificial lighting, lit by candlelight only. A lot of times they used mirrors, which would have been very expensive, um, but the refle reflective qualities would have really enhanced the way that these pieces would have looked. So just imagine this gilded, elaborate tabernacle and a candle in front of each of these mirrors. It would have been incredibly stunning. So as I mentioned, um, the Manila galleon trade um, meant that ivory was one of the the um, materials that came back to the New World. Um, this is an example of a Hispano-Philippine sculpture. So this probably was made in uh, the Spanish colony of the Philippines. The ivory sculpture opposite it of the Virgin Mary, where Molly is, is most likely have been made in um, the Portuguese colonies of Goa. Um, and there are a couple stylistic things that we can see uh, that are different. So if you look at this sculpture, um, the anatomy is very naturally, realistically done. Um, and that uh, points to European influences. 
But then if you look at the figure's hair, um, we have these very stylized curls, snail-like curls. And those um, are more likely to have been influenced by, um, by Indian art and the, the work that was done in the colonies, in uh, the Portuguese colonies. Um, another interesting thing that links to our collection um, and something that is um, throughout the show as well is that oftentimes these European influences were through prints. So prints could be easily disseminated um, and the subject matter would have been um, would have been a source for many of these pieces. So this is thought to have been um, inspired by a print by Lucas Cranach the Elder, an early 16th century print. And of course, you'll be familiar with our Lucas Cranach the Elder painting downstairs. Um, and this again, they made these very elaborate bases for these figures. And this one has um, a mirror in the front. So again, it would have had a candle in front of it reflecting the light uh, with that mirror. Um, religion was so important to people that people of all means were contrib not only contributing to um, works that were for the church, but were also commissioning works for their homes. So when we go to the next section, you'll see smaller and more modest works of art. Um, but everybody would have had these in their homes because they were an aid to prayer. Um, and within the churches, some of the work that you see here is work that would have been in public areas of the churches, but some of it would have been in areas that were only accessible by the clergy, but every single space in the church would have been elaborately decorated. So I mentioned silver as being one of the important um, trade items. And um, there are a number of silver pieces in this show. The mines were in Peru, and these were really a main source of wealth for the Spanish colonies. Um, and again, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that the candlelight would have been the only light in the space. So you can imagine that these candles would have been these almost floating pinpoints of light, would have really contributed to the contemplative atmosphere of the church. Um, and the silver, again, would have been used as a way to reflect that light and give this almost otherworldly atmosphere. So here we have a pair of candlesticks. These would have been up on the altar. And this is just a pair, but there probably would have been more of them. Um, and then the chandeliers above you. Um, again, very delicately um, detailed. They're very high up, I know, but if you look up and see the chain, the chain is also original to these pieces, and it's an incredibly beautifully worked, heavy silver chain. Um, I've selected the works uh, for the tour to give uh, a chance to both communicate these main concepts that we've been talking about, but also to provide a variety of things for you to talk about. So um, we're next going to look at a couple of chairs. These are two armchairs that were made for Caracas Cathedral in the 18th century. And with these two chairs, we can really look at the evolution of style over the course of a century. Um, these two pieces are actually going to the Denver Art Museum after the show finishes traveling. Um, and the curator, Jorge Rivas Perez, talked about the significance of the gift. And he says that this piece is nothing less than a piece produced in collaboration by two of Caracas's most important artists in the latter half of the 18th century. And those were Domingo Gutierrez, who did the woodworking, and Juan Pedro Lopez, who did painting and gilding. And we're going to look at um, Juan Pedro Lopez's, one of his paintings in the show next. But he's someone, if you go through the show, you'll see a number of works by him. 
um, and he was quite a well-known um, artist. Um, so this chair is based on Spanish models, mid-18th century Spanish models. You can see it has a fairly simple structure. Um, it's made of Spanish cedar, which was a wood that was um, native to Central and South America and the Caribbean. So this is a material that you wouldn't have seen used in Europe prior to this time. Um, likewise, this chair is made out of mahogany, um, which is a wood native to Central America and the Caribbean. And this section of the show is art for personal devotion. So these would have been works that were in people's homes. Um, and they were in more private areas of the homes than the first section of the show that we looked at. So these would be paintings that might have been in the corner of a bedroom. And people had a close physical relationship with these objects as well. So um, they were an aid to prayer and um, physical closeness, like touching them or kissing them, was also something that helped bring um, a closeness to um, the spiritual nature of them. Um, also, you'll find some unique images in this section. While people often commissioned um, images of Christ and of the Virgin Mary, they also commissioned specific saints who could be protectors um, and who could contribute to um, keeping them from particular problems that they had. So, for example, we have St. Mark Margaret of Antioch here. This is from 1769 by Jose Antonio de Porres. Um, and Saint Margaret was a patron saint of pregnant women. Um, she was called upon in times of difficult childbirths, um, but she also had a general ability to intercede um, with evil. Um, she was a per real person according to the tale that she lived in the fourth century um, and was born into a pagan family and converted to Christianity um, and decided to devote her virginity to um, her faith. So she rejected pressure to get married um, and she was persecuted for her faith and um, bore many trials and uh, tribulations before being martyred eventually. Uh, but one of the torments that is described um, as having been experienced by Saint Margaret is having been swallowed by Satan in the form of a dragon. And she, being in the body of the dragon, took her cross and slashed open the body of the dragon and it escaped. And what we see here is after that episode, her triumphant overcoming of the dragon. Um, so she, you see she's standing on it, she's holding him by a chain, and she's bearing the cross that saved her. And you can even see the symbolic opening of the clouds in the sky around her head, um, again showing that um, the light coming and uh, good overcoming the evil. Um, another the things that I encourage you to, to look at and point out when you um, talk about these works is the frames. Um, they're incredibly gorgeous. Um, this frame is original to the work. I think the frames, the care um, that was taken in creating these elaborately carved and gilded frames um, enhances this sense that we have of how important these objects were to people. Um, and the last work I'm going to talk about is a very unique one. This is the a Pinna Oratory. This was made in Brazil in the 18th century. And this is one example of um, this cross-cultural exchange resulting in an innovative form of art. Um, so the Pinna refers to lapis or caves. And specifically refers to the caves in Brazil where the calcite was mined that was used to make the little figures in here. Um, this format with two tiers um, is pretty typical of these Lapinha, excuse me, Lapinha oratories. And um, 
These come from the region of Minas Gerais in Brazil. Um, and you can take a look at the individual figures. There are some figures that um, people may recognize um, from your earlier discussion of, for example, the Immaculate Conception that's in the very first tabernacle. We see the Immaculate Conception um, in the top row on the left. Then we have the Crucifixion of Christ. We have um, Joseph with the Christ Child. Um, and in the second row, we have St. John the Baptist. Uh, we have uh, St. Anne uh, reading with the Virgin Mary as a young girl. Um, and this one, in your notes, I put it as uh, unknown. So formerly known as unknown, now known as, I think, St. Um, Joachim, the father of uh, the Virgin Mary. And then here we have a scene of the nativity. Um, so we have a scene of the birth of Christ and the crucifixion of Christ. Um, and one thing here that there may be opportunity for um, getting people to look more closely and to ask and answer questions. Um, we have here Mary and Joseph and the Christ child, and we have the three magi. Uh, but we also have these two figures, these two tiny, unusual figures in the front. And um, while we want to be really sensitive about um, making any assumptions that people are familiar with Christianity, because they may or may not be, um, I think that with these two figures, you might have an opportunity to ask people, you know, who do you think those figures are? Um, you can see that their garb is completely different from the... Um, the biblical figures, um, and these were likely the donors of this work, um, which they may be familiar with if they um, come to see the cross collection as well.